bless you. Okay. Well, we're living in interesting times. In fact, um, in uh, 2 Timothy 3, Paul described the times that we're in. Um, well, one accurate translation would be demonized. He said in the last days there will come troublous times. And indeed, we are having um, troublous times. But I, I'd like to start by encouraging us, if I can. <laughs> uh, I was reminded of it because I had a phone call from Brenda uh, at about 20 to 4, or quarter to 4, I think, to tell me that she was stuck and had a flat tire. She was on the M4. <clears throat> she was trying to get to Swindon. Anyway, um, that was all right. I think she was, I think she was um, at peace by the time she drove off again. And of course, it reminded me, in fact, she reminded me, um, she, she said, well, we know all about burst tires, don't we? And I don't know how many of you will know that uh, early in December, um, shortly before I was due to go to America to see my family, I had been to um, High Wycombe. I had been to visit a family uh, who had plenty of troubles and a lot of generational stuff in their background. And we'd had a best part of a day together. <clears throat> and I was driving home back down to Dorset. And I was on the A31 when suddenly it seemed as if all hell had broken loose. I think, in fact, a front tire had actually exploded, which is not usual. I mean, they usually give some warning if they're going to do that. And it wasn't a cheap tire either. <laughs> anyway, it did, it did that. The car became absolutely uncontrollable. It was half past seven in the evening, so it was dark by then in, on, in December. And the car went all over the place. And I'm sure, I'm sure it hit the central barrier and came back again, hit it again more than once. And there were several miracles. The first miracle was at half past seven on a December evening. Um, it's a fast dual carriageway road. It was a miracle that I didn't hit anything because the car was completely out of control. I didn't know where it was going to go next. In fact, eventually I didn't even know where it was, except that I was still in it. And I, I didn't hit any other traffic at all. And um, it was a fast road and the car must have been doing 70-ish when, when the car burst. So I had an interesting um, roller coaster ride and I wound up in a six foot deep ditch on the left hand side, on the near side of the road. And it was remarkable. I could have hit fences. I could have hit anything. But I wound up and it was like a soft landing. And there I was sitting in the car thinking to myself, well, what does one do next? As all the airbags had inflated and the car was on its right hand side. So the driver's door was downwards in this um, ditch of undergrowth. And the ditch was about six feet deep. Well, I was, I was thinking about it and um, uh, the, uh, somebody must have alerted the emergency services because they turned up and saw the situation and suggested to me that I might be able to get out of the roof. Um, you know, could I do that? I said, yes, I can, I can do that. So I got out of the roof and they helped me up the rest of the way. I think it was the far, the fast fireman who uh, helped me up the remaining six feet because it's a deep ditch. And um, the, uh, the uh, paramedics then took over and got me into their ambulance and said, well, where are you hurt? And I said, I'm not. Um, they, they looked at me a bit strangely and said, well, you must be hurt somewhere. And I said, well, you find out where, as far as I know, I, I, I haven't got a scratch or a bruise on me, and I hadn't. Anyway, they thought I must at least have been in severe shock. So they kept me for an hour in their ambulance with an ECG on me all the time 
and the blood pressure cuff on me all the time, checking all the vital workings and looking in my eyes every now and then, see if they were still open or if they, if they dilated or what they'd done. And um, I felt a sense of complete peace. Uh, from from the, the whole thing, I didn't feel a sense of shock at any point. And finally, after an hour, they said, well, we don't know how you got out of that car in one piece. I mean, I hadn't actually seen at that point what it looked like. Uh, it didn't look too good. Um, but they said, well, you, you, might, as well, you might as well go home. Um, so I, I rang up my cousin, uh, who was uh, fortunately still up and doing, and, and said, well, this, this ambulance has just reached Poole General Hospital. Would you fancy a 20 mile drive to come and get me? So he very kindly did. <clears throat> the, the car was a write off. I don't, I, I've had to replace that since. And I had to uh, delay my flight to America because I had to deal with all sorts of insurance matters. But I can testify to an absolute miracle. I mean, when I saw the pictures, I saw the photographs the police had taken. Uh, I looked at it and I thought, I don't know how anybody got out of that car in one piece or even perhaps alive. And the police were so struck that unusually for them, one of the policemen rang me up at home the following evening. And I, I said, well, yes, what can I do for you? And he said, well, I just wanted to see if you were all right. I wanted to make sure you were OK. He said, all the evidence on the road shows that you had a burst tire and the car's an absolute mess, so are you really all right? And I said, yes, I'm really all right. And he said, well, I don't know. He said, you really got away with it. And I, I said, well, I call it a miracle. And he said, well, I think I'll have to call it a miracle as well. Anyway, that's the power of God. It's the goodness of God. The Lord protects his people. The Lord watches over his people. The Lord will never abandon his people. He is always with us. Even when you're concentrating on, on the road and you're not thinking about God at all, he's thinking about you. And whether it was angels in control of that car or, or, or the Lord's hand himself or what, I have no idea. All I know is that it was God. Um, I don't think he got me into that mess, but I'm sure he got me out of it. So that's, that's the goodness of God. And we're living in times where we need to know the power of our God. We need to know that our God is able to do whatever he pleases. Psalm 115, I think, isn't it? it says, our God is seated in the heavens. He does whatever he pleases. And, and he does. And sometimes we're puzzled because we think, well, Lord, why are you not doing this? Well, we often are puzzled, but he always has a reason. There's, there's always a reason for why God does or doesn't do uh, what he does. Now, we're in a time, aren't we, of great shaking. Um, I don't think anybody need wonder about that. And when God wants to um, draw attention, he uses one of, three, one of three factors as a rule. He uses war, famine, and plague. Well, at the moment, we can see war, not just, not just the war in Ukraine. I know Putin says it isn't a war, but it is. In fact, it's a really brutal medieval type war now, the same sort of war that uh, the Russians used in Aleppo when they raised, raised that to the ground. And we have war, but we have other wars. We have a brutal war in Yemen. Um, we have all kinds of rumours and threats of wars and commotions and upheavals and insurgencies. You can, you can translate that second word in all sorts of ways. But it's wars and commotions, wars and upheavals. And we are seeing those. We have seen a plague. We are still seeing the plague. Um, two years ago, when I was waiting on the Lord about the pandemic, which had just started, it was only a few weeks after my wife Valerie had died, but I was spending a lot of time with the Lord, 
and he spoke to me at that time and he said effectively this thing is from me not not that god was the author of the evil god was not the creator of this uh, awful virus which had escaped from a, a laboratory and had gone worldwide <clears throat> god god didn't create that virus as it was but he used it and he used it uh, and as as i understood him he said he was using it on a global basis because there is a worldwide turning away from God, a worldwide rejection of him, and a worldwide manifestation of two um, particular aspects which grieves him deeply. One is that abortion is virtually a worldwide phenomenon now, and the other is a worldwide rejection of God as creator. And those two things distress him, anger him um, and and also uh, in, in fact stir up his concern and his desire to have mercy on the human beings who are being so misled because he knows where believing the lies will lead us. I went to a meeting a week or two ago and the lady who normally leads it was not there but I was told something which was I really found quite extraordinary because um, <clears throat> she, she was somebody who, um, she'd been, a, I think, an Anglican church girl all her life. And um, she, she, was, she was into all sorts of things. I mean, she, she liked New Age. She liked med contemplative prayer. She liked all these uh, all these things, and um, it was pointed out to her that there is a narrow way, and we're supposed to walk on it. And if you can believe it, she said, well, I prefer to walk on the Broadway. Well, do you think she's ever read where the Broadway leads? Jesus said the broad path leads to destruction. Is that, is that and, and yet, and yet somebody, somebody was actually wanting to walk on the broad path. Satan's best possible <clears throat> weapon at this time is deception. But he'll use anything else. You remember, he's, he's the great serpent and the dragon. And the serpent is the deceiver and the dragon is the persecutor. But actually, he doesn't need to use much of the dragon if he can get us all deceived. Once we're deceived, he doesn't need to persecute us. He's got us anyway. But these are times when God is saying to us, you need to hold fast the truth. Brethren, we need to remember that we are receiving a kingdom that cannot be shaken. It's a wonderful thing. If you know Daniel chapter 2 and Nebuchadnezzar's uh, dream, vision, do you remember that Daniel was the only one who could interpret it for him? And he interpreted it accurately to the king. And he told the king that there were going to be four empires which would um, um, hold sway over the people of Israel in succession. And they did. There was the Babylonian, which was the golden head. There was the Persian, which was the silver. There was the uh, Greek which was the um, uh, bronze, and then there was the Roman Empire, which was iron, and finally there would be an empire, which was a mixture, because the feet were made, of, the toes were made of iron and clay, so that the thing couldn't hold together. That may or may not represent the EU. There's been a lot of argument about that, and I don't think we can say for certain, but there is, there is coming a time of another great world empire and the antichrist will be the last will be the uh, instigator of the last great world empire and we read all about it in um in, in revelation but what fascinates me is that in this picture in this dream that nebuchadnezzar had which daniel interpreted to him and by the way, he saved his own life and the life of all pharaohs, of all Nebuchadnezzar's magicians. 
The, uh, <clears throat> as he watched, there was a stone cut out without hands from the hillside. And the stone fell on the feet of the statue. And the result was the whole statue was crushed into powder and blew away into the earth. All those, all those kingdoms will be present and recognizable. In fact, I think they're pretty much pre present and recognizable in their characteristics right now. We can certainly see the Greek empire of humanism. Um, we, we, can, we can see the other ones too, if we look carefully. But uh, <clears throat> what is going to happen is that all these empires will be um, visible and apparent at the time when the stone cut out without hands, which is the kingdom of God, which is, which, which is what happens when the Lord returns and establishes his kingdom, and his kingdom will crush all the other kingdoms. Do you remember that in the wilderness testings, um, do you remember Satan took uh, Jesus when he was trying at, at every point to get him to fall? Because if he got him to fall, uh, he would have um, done away with our salvation. If he'd once stepped out of the will of God, um, he, he would, we would have been lost. And he was tested on three major things. And one of them was that the devil took him to the top of a very high mountain and showed him all the kingdoms of the world. And he said to him, all these kingdoms I will give to you if you will fall down and worship me. Do you remember that? Well, you might have thought that Jesus would have said straight off, you're a liar. You haven't got any authority to give, to give them to me at all. But he didn't say that. He didn't say it for the simple reason that Satan was actually speaking the truth. The kingdoms of this world belong to the prince of this world. He's established them. He rules over them. The prince of darkness rules over them. And Jesus has no interest in the kingdoms of this world. He's going to do away with the whole lot when he comes. And he's going to establish his own kingdom. That's a pretty good thought at the moment when you look around the world situation. And... <clears throat> It was, it was for us that he stood those tests in the wilderness after 40 days and 40 nights of uh, uh, hunger and thirst and the heat and cold of the Judean wilderness. And it says he was very hungry. Well, he must have been on his beam ends. But he relied on the word of God to drive off the testings that Satan was being allowed to put to him. We are citizens of another kingdom yet to be revealed. Uh, let, let's just have a look at that. Um, I'm not going where I intended to go at all, um, but I want to go to Hebrews chapter 11, if you have your Bibles. If you have Hebrews chapter 11, and uh, let's get my glasses checked. Um, verse 8. Verse 8. <clears throat> By faith, Abraham, when called to go to a place he would later receive as his inheritance, obeyed and went, even though he did not know where he was going. By faith, he made his home in the promised land, like a stranger in a foreign country. He lived in tents, as did Isaac and Jacob, who were heirs with him of, of the same promise. For he was looking forward to the city with foundations, whose architect and builder is God. God had promised them that land. He'd promised them Canaan as an everlasting inheritance. Oh, yes. Um, <clears throat> promised them Canaan as an everlasting inheritance. And yet they didn't put down any roots. They didn't build any houses. They didn't build a city. They made their home like strangers and lived in tents, uh, as just as sojourners, as, as those who were 
camping in the land. Why was this? Because Isaac and Jacob were heirs of him of that promise as well. And it says, for he was looking forward to the city with foundations whose architect and builder is God. Brethren, do you realize that Abraham had a revelation from God of the new Jerusalem? He had a revelation of, he had a revelation of Revelation chapter 21 and 22. God was showing him the ultimate aim. He was showing him the ultimate outcome, which would be the new Jerusalem, the city coming down out of heaven onto earth. No wonder he was content to live where he was because he'd seen something so much better. And he was glad. He was glad to live as a, um, as a sojourner in the land. It says all these people were still living by faith when they died. That's verse 13. They did not receive the things promised. They had been promised, but they didn't actually receive them at the time. They only saw them and welcomed them from a distance. And they admitted that they were aliens and strangers on earth. Brethren, if we belong to the Lord Jesus... We are aliens and strangers on earth. We belong to another kingdom. That is not to say that we're not at the moment uh, citizens of the temporary kingdoms of this world. We are. But we are already citizens of an eternal kingdom which will never pass away. I find that quite an exciting thought. I mean, I, I know where my wife's gone. She won't see that kingdom yet because that hasn't yet come into being. But she's seeing the face of God. She's with the Lord. And there have been times in the last couple of years when I've been thoroughly envious. I've thought, well, I, I wouldn't mind something better than this. But as we, as we plow on, since they admitted they were aliens and strangers on earth, people who say such things show that they are looking for a country of their own. They've been looking for the country they had left they would have had opportunity to return. I mean, we can go back to the world system and live in it. But it's, it's, uh, it's, it's not advisable. Um, because he says instead, they were longing for a better country, a heavenly one. Therefore, God is not ashamed to be called their God, for he has prepared a city for them. God's prepared something for us, which is so wonderful. No wonder he says in Luke, um, when you see all these things start to happen, all these terrible events start to happen, he says, look up, for your salvation is drawing near. And we're seeing all the signs of the times. We're seeing earthquakes and famines and wars and commotions. And there's one other time, uh, other sign, which was not there um, <clears throat> when the last major war was fought. And that is the sign of the fig tree, that Israel is back in her own land. And that is significant, that uh, the Lord is preparing Israel for what is to happen between now and his return. And if I read Daniel correctly, I think there's quite a bit to happen between now and his return. But he is going to return to Jerusalem. Now, these are days when God's shaking all the pillars of our society. We've turned our backs to him. Do you know, I believe it's true to say that we've reached a point where people say, will say now, not only that, well, I suppose perhaps there must be a God somewhere, but I don't know who he is or where he is. People have reached a point where they believe it's not even necessary to believe that there might be a God at all. We are now so humanistic that we think men will do it all. Evolution has sorted itself out so far, and our secular humanism is a hideous mixture of Freud and Marx and Darwin. And we don't have time for God, and most people don't seem to think that a God is necessary. But I think God thinks that he's very necessary. You see, he's shaking all the pillars of our society to try and get our attention. 
I don't know how long our present queen will last. She is now a very frail old lady, but it's going to be a major blow to our unwritten constitution when she dies. What kind of upheaval there may be, um, I just don't know, but the possibilities are, um, well, we could come into a period of great instability. I think that's probably the best way of, of putting it. Now there's war, there's pandemic. The pandemic is not going to go away. Anybody who thinks that COVID is going away or, or to look at the news at the moment, it's starting up again. We're, we're getting an increasing number of COVID cases once again in this country. There is a new variant. God said that it would not go away. And it isn't going away. It's simply changing its nature and once we think it's all under control, the next variant pops up. And um, it is really quite a nuisance. I, I know because I had COVID while I was in America. My, my grandson was kind enough to go to a children's party. He's just about eight years old. But he went to a children's party on the Saturday. And I baptized him in the morning service in their church on the Sunday, which was a great joy. And on Monday, he had a temperature of 104, and uh, he was diagnosed with COVID. And two days later, the three adults in the house were all diagnosed with COVID as well. In fact, I was blessed by getting off more likely than anybody else. Uh, I, I mean, uh, my, my son and daughter-in-law were, were quite hard hit. And I found myself, I, I found that grandpa was getting up in the morning to get Jonathan his breakfast because Jonathan got over it rather quickly. But it's left its mark. I thought I got over it very lightly and I had, but it's left me with a long-term fatigue. Um, I'm still struggling with the exhaustion now, which I didn't expect to get. And I wondered why it was still going on, but it does seem to be one of the factors of this horrible bug. Now, what is going to happen apart from war and, and, uh, and plague? Well, it's going to be famine. The results of the war and the plague together is going to hit the economies so hard that we are going to see famine in many places. Please, God, that if he's merciful, we don't see famine in this country, but we may. We're seeing all sorts of things happen. Do you know that when I started driving a motor car, it was three shillings and sixpence per gallon? It's now something like seven pounds fifty per gallon. It, it's, uh, I mean, it's almost unbelievable. And it's set, set to go higher yet. Um, as, as, as the price of oil goes up, and we're going to see the price of gas go up, and we're going to see the uh, retail index going up and up, and we're going to see the price of food go up. And some people are going to be severely hit, which is, which is a terrible, I mean, it's a terrible prospect. I think I heard a figure quoted the other day that some people are going to be um, um, charging, being charged about 67 pounds uh, for their heating and essentials, and their total income will only be about 75. That is a horrifying prospect, and we're going to have to live with it, and we're going to have to see what is right to do about it. And if the rich don't start giving to the poor, um, all sorts of things may happen. Well, it will be nice to, to declare that people will recover from the virus, but if God's declared that there's going to be a virus, you can declare until the cows come home and God won't take any notice because the only declarations that God takes notice of is declaration which God actually makes himself. If God hasn't made the declaration, well, we can shout it to the heavens and the heavens will be like brass. So I, I hope that anybody who thinks we can declare everything out of the way is right uh, because I've uh, seen times when we've declared certain things and absolutely nothing's happened. Uh, God is complaining about his rejection as creator. That's in Romans chapter one. 
You know, in Romans chapter one, there is an amazing statement um, where it says in verse, there are, there are three stages of judgment God sends on rejection of him as creator. And the third one starts in verse 28, and it says, furthermore, since they did not think it worthwhile to retain the knowledge of God. Wasn't worthwhile to retain the knowledge of God. Are you, are you not a bit shattered, even horrified by that? The people think it isn't worthwhile to retain the knowledge of God. Well, God thinks it's very worthwhile. And I must say, I agree with him, and I hope all of you do too. But they don't, because of that, it says he gave them over to a depraved mind to do what ought not to be done. And we see all kinds of hideous things happening as a result of God giving us over to a depraved mind. We're inventing worse and worse things. Um, we're, we're rejecting not only God as creator, we're rejecting um, the very nature of his creation. We have this insanity, which denies the very biology which keeps the human race going. I mean, are you not surprised? I certainly am. Mm. I don't, I don't. I don't think we've seen the the rest of COVID yet. I have to disagree with my brother, who's just put a note up for me. Um, but uh, we, we shall see what happens. God is not through with us yet. Until God sees repentance, he's not going to be through with us because he's create, complaining about the rejection as creator. He's complaining about our rejection of the very way he's created. And you can't insult God much more, can you, than to say that he created male and female, he made a mistake. And some of them should have been female and some of them should have been male and they've got the right to choose. I'm sorry, but God chose at conception. But in addition to that, we have the matter of abortion, which is very much in front of us most of the time now. It's in Parliament. Uh, it's, it's before us as, as the people of God. Oh, heavens, are more... Yeah quite dear people we are going off on a wrong track i need to say this now because i know a lot of people um who i know a lot of people now who are focusing um <clears throat> focusing on the evil and the supposed evil and the evil which could yet happen. And the result of that is that you do not focus on God. And if ever there was a time we need to be focusing on God, it is now. Yes, we need to be knowing facts of things that are going on, but we don't need to be knowing suppositions. And I am alarmed at the number of people who are picking up on conspiracy theories, some of which just fall to the ground as being rubbish, some of which are unproved, but none of which are, are a match for God. In the meantime, we go on aborting children. And abortion is the shedding of innocent blood. Now in Numbers 35 and verse 33, the shedding of innocent blood pollutes the land. And God says that the land can only be made clean by the shedding of the blood of those who shed, who polluted the land in this way. In other words, the, uh, the, door, the uh, judgment lies at the door of those who have carried out the abortions. And it's only the shedding of their blood which cleanses the land. This is a terrible thing. But thank God for the blood of Jesus, which is a substitute. But we need to plead that blood as a substitute in uh, plain, straight, um, repentance. God said to Cain, your brother's blood is crying out to you from the land. About 15 years ago, my friend Hugh Kitson and I made a documentary about abortion. Not many people liked it, but it was, it was true enough. 
And remember that uh, abortion, um, the shedding of innocent blood, is one of the key factors, in fact, it's the key factor, which sent Judah into exile in Babylon. It says of King Manasseh in 2 Kings 2.21 um, that uh, Manasseh shed, he did all sorts of evil things, but he shed blood, he filled Jerusalem from end to end with the shedding of innocent blood. And verse, you go over it into chapter 24 of 2 Kings, and you get these horrifying words. It says, and the Lord is not willing to forgive. Well, that's amazing. We thought the Lord was always willing to forgive, but he wasn't willing to forgive that sin. The shedding of innocent blood is one of the most despicable sins and horrendous sins because it's destroying what he has already made. If you shed innocent blood, you are killing what God has made. Cain shed innocent blood when he killed Abel, whom God had created. And when you come to Jeremiah chapter 15, you find that the beginning of the chapter, it says, even if, if David and Samuel st stood before me, um, sorry, is it, is it David and Samuel? Let me have a look and make sure. Jeremiah chapter 15. I'm going to read it because God is really wanting to make it a point and get it home to us. Yeah, sorry, if Moses. Then the Lord said to me, Jeremiah 15, even if Moses and Samuel were to stand before me, uh, sorry, 2 Kings 24, where it says that God would not was not willing to forgive. Can't remember the verse, but it's in the chapter. Even if Moses and Samuel were to stand before me, you would have thought Moses and Samuel would have had some clout with God, wouldn't you? And he would have listened to them. But he said, even if they were to stand before me, my heart would not go out to this people. Send them away from my presence. Let them go. And if they ask you, where shall we go? Tell them, this is what the Lord says. Those destined for death to death. Those for the sword to the sword. Those for starvation to starvation those for captivity to captivity. I will send four kinds of destroyers against them, declares the Lord, the sword to kill and the dogs to drag away and the birds of the air and the beasts of the earth to devour and destroy. I will make them abhorrent to all the kingdoms of the earth because of what Manasseh, son of Hezekiah, king of Judah, did in Jerusalem. So in Jeremiah 15, it's being repeated again. The, the sin of Manasseh of filling Jerusalem from end to end with the innocent blood and God saying, because of that, all these terrible things will come upon the people. And they were driven into exile into Jerusalem, into uh, Babylon for 70 years. Brethren, God is not mocked. His word stands forever. I'm not sure quite how long I've got. I'm sure um, I'm sure some some people think I've said quite enough already, um, but there is some more that I should like to say. Yes, please do. Is that all right? Well, we we, we have we have got time. You right. um, so um, say another fifteen minutes. Will that will that be okay? Okay, thank you. Okay. Anna. Right, I should like to um, tell you. You remember the sixties were a pretty bad. Um, decade for Britain and for a lot of other places too. And in the 60s, we passed all sorts of legislation which has led us down a false path. And one of them was the Abortion Bill of the Abortion Act of 1967. Now, in 1988, David Alton, who is now Lord Alton, brought into Parliament a private member's bill attempting to reduce the um, age at which, up to which abortion could take place. And there was much argument at the time because the attempt was to reduce, uh, he wanted to reduce the um, uh, age limit for abortion to take place from 28 weeks down to 18. And it went into committee and it was, dis and it was um, talked about and they discussed 22 weeks or 24 weeks or 20 weeks. And all those who were 
leaders of the prayer, prayer groups at that time were urging everybody to get behind this bill in prayer because it was necessary that this bill should pass through Parliament and we should be able to reduce the age of abortion. And I started trying to pray. And I found to my horror that I couldn't pray. And I was appalled because I thought, God, what is the matter with me? Have I committed some gross sin that you won't hear me? God, that you won't let me pray? What, what's wrong? Lord, what have I done? Because I could only think that I must have done something wrong that I couldn't pray. Anyway, I waited on the Lord because I felt I needed to know. In fact, I desperately needed to know. And finally, the Lord showed me something. And he said, David, suppose you went home to your wife this evening and said, darling, I've been committing adultery seven nights a week, but I'm really repenting now and I'm reducing it to four nights. Would she have been pleased? And well, the obvious answer stuck out a mile, didn't it? And I realized that God was not uh, letting me pray for this bill to succeed because it was not going to succeed. And some of the intercessory leaders were very angry with me, accused me of undermining faith. But I had to say, God has said it's not going to succeed because he doesn't, he's not interested in reducing the amount of sin. He's interested in repenting from the sin. In other words, it's a zero option with God. And anything less than zero for um, legalized abortion will not please the heart of God, and he will not respond. And we're still in the same state, and we're still going on aborting, and we're having abortion at home, and and then that is that is still uh, permissible at the moment. They they did they um, there was there was a defeat for the assisted dying bill the other night, but the uh, the the abortion at home legislation is still valid and women are still um, aborting at home with the pill that can be sent to them and so more and more abortions are happening and many women are suffering some have become very ill some have even died as a result of complications with this home abortion brethren if we do not raise our voices about this then we are not mouthpiece for god and God wants his body to be his mouthpiece. We are a prophetic people. We are, some are called to say more than others, but we are all a prophetic people. And together we have a voice for God. And it is a voice against what the world is doing. Uh, I, should, I should like to say something, something else, if I may, um, because afterwards, uh, not very long afterwards, we had the um, legislation about allowing trading on Sunday. And so the Sunday trading bill came in. The Sunday trading bill came in and people thought that we ought really to pray that this didn't happen so that our Sundays were still not spoiled by, by um, you know, Sunday shopping. And I started to try and pray about that and I heard something which brought me up short because God spoke to me and God, God said, I'll get interest in your Sunday trading when you get interested in my murdered unborn children. And I thought, oh, yes, Lord, I've, I've, got, I've just got to agree with you. He, say, he said that the Sunday trading is nothing to me compared with the killing of unborn children. It, it, is, it is terrible. Now, brethren, we've had two years of pandemic and we've had Zoom meetings and uh, I've taken part in a lot of Zoom meetings put on by Issaca ministries as well. And I've, I've found something which is a bit disturbing in these days because we have been able to um, join together uh, in, in church meetings for, for quite a while now. In fact, I was in a very good one last Sunday myself up in Guildford. Um, um, was it, was it, <clears throat> it was actually near Guildford. It was in Wanash. And I thoroughly enjoyed it. It was just wonderful to be together with God's people again. 
But I've found that a number of people have become very comfortable with being provided with church on Sunday afternoon in their own armchairs. This is what Issachar does. Is Issachar um, gives them a, a teaching and uh, readings and, and worship and even a communion. And we have all of that on a Sunday afternoon. And some people have come to really like it. And they don't really want to bother to do anything else. After all, if you want to, you can sit in your pajamas with the, uh, with the laptop in front of you. And, and nobody gives a hoot. Well, maybe God doesn't too, bother too much about pajamas, but that, that's sort of, I mean, I, I, don't think, I don't think we would go to an ordinary meeting in pajamas as a rule. It shows that, that we've, we've got to the point where we are tending to a, um, a dangerous place of slipping away from what God wants. You see, Hebrews 10 says, do not forsake the assembling of yourselves together. And it's for the purpose of encouragement and upbuilding. Because I know there are some who think that uh, the, the rapture will take place before anything nasty happens. I'm sorry, I can't support that from scripture, so I can't say that it's true. Um, I, wish, I wish I could. And if it is true, I'd be more than happy. Um, but, uh, but from scripture, I can't say that it's true. And I believe that God's people are going to have to go through a very great deal of suffering um, before the Lord returns. I, I find much scripture to support that. And the ecclesia, the gathering together of God's people, is to encourage and support one another. As the days get darker, we need to assemble together to encourage one another. As times become harder, and during that time, we should be doing the exact opposite of what the world is doing. We are here to glorify the Lord. The most important function of the church, apart from the Great Commission, is in Ephesians 3.21, where it says, to him be glory in the church. Do you remember, God has wanted his glory to be known uh, right from the beginning. Moses, in Exodus 33, asked that he could see God's glory, and God showed him his glory as much as he could see. He said, you can't look on my face but I will show you my, I will pass behind you. I will show you a God of mercy, a God of compassion. You realize that probably every miracle Jesus did was to demonstrate God's compassion. It was never to be a conjurer on a platform. He always showed the love, the compassion, the mercy of God. And God said to Moses, that is his glory. His essential glory is his very character which is why we say God is good. And Jesus, Jesus said, why do you say, why do you say that uh, um, <clears throat> I am good? Do you not know there's only one who is good? That is God. That, I think, was because he was asking the man, are you recognizing that I am God myself? Because that's when he said it. I wish I had time to unpack all this rather more. But... We are, to, we are to glorify him. Jesus' main motive was to glorify God. If you will read John chapter 12, you'll find that some Greeks came to Jesus and wanted to see him. And uh, Peter and Andrew uh, came, was it Andrew? It was certainly Andrew, uh, came to Jesus and said, there are some Gentiles wanting to see you. And you never hear a word about these Gentiles again. They don't appear again in Scripture. But Jesus immediately says, the hour has come. And what shall I say? Shall I say, Father, save me from this hour? No, but for this reason I came to this hour. Father, glorify your name. The motive which carried Jesus through everything was to glorify the name of God. And you remember, he came out from Gethsemane, he came out to be arrested, knowing all that was to befall him. He was knowing everything that was going to happen. And it wasn't just the physical agony of the crucifixion, or the Roman scourgings, or the three illegal trials. 
what he was so concerned about was something he had never experienced before, and that was eternal death. He was going to be separated from the Father. And that is eternal death. And he knew he was going to experience that with its awfulness and be made sin for us so that we didn't have to be. So that we don't have to ever be separated from the Father. That's why if we believe in Jesus, we are always, uh, the Father will never abandon us. And, but he went through eternal death and he just didn't know if he could cope with it. But his motive was to glorify the Father. So while he said, Father, oh, Lord, and he said in Gethsemane, you remember that this cup might pass from me. But at the end of it all, he said, Father, thy will be done. Father, glorify your name. And the voice came from heaven in John 12 saying, I have glorified it and I will glorify it again. And I think I must say it, say it briefly now. Um, there are two uh, chapters of scripture, which I, I, I would love it if you would take away and really study, because there are two ways in which we glorify the Lord in the church. It says to him be glory in the church. How do we glorify him in the ecclesia? Well, we glorify him, you'll find, in John 15. And John 15 is, the, is that we glorify him by willing to lay down our lives for one another. We glorify him by putting one another's interests higher than our own, and if necessary, going right to the point of laying down our lives for each other, the ultimate. And that is that, is that glorifies God, as you will find in John 15. And then the great high priestly prayer of John 17, you will find that the glory comes there when Jesus prayed for the God to give them the glory, and he puts it in the context of the unity of the body, that they may all be one, even as you are one and I am one, you in me and I in you, and he almost ties a knot with it. It's the unity of the body, and brethren, you cannot have the agape love, the sacrificial love of John 15, without finding that you have the unity of John 17 as well. The body of Messiah, which will really glorify God, has both. You can't separate them. If you've got one, you'll find the other. If you haven't got one, you probably won't find the other. And the Lord is saying, will you glorify me through all that lies ahead. Now, I know that we could have an argument uh, as to what lies ahead, because frankly, we don't know all that lies ahead, but we do know that great times of darkness come, are coming. But the Lord says, when you see all these things happen, look up, for your salvation is drawing near. Look up, because what is our salvation? Our salvation is our Redeemer coming back. He's coming back to get us. But there are things to happen first. Please, God, that we may have the grace and the strength and the courage, which only comes from the Holy Spirit, to stand firm and to glorify his name. I think I've said enough for one afternoon, and I'm going to stop there. Thank you.